Thank you, Richie, very much. Jim Reed's tenure of the Taylor Chair of Germans at Oxford has been characterised by a passionate commitment to the teaching of both undergraduate and postgraduate students, to research of the highest distinction and value, and to defending universities and their Geistige Lebensform against economic and political instrumentalisation, even when and precisely when it came for some from such Oxford graduates as Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> She was, alas, not the only one, moreover, sie war die letzte nicht, to borrow and vary a phrase of Mephisto's <laughs> from Goethe's Funus. Professorships can be important things. I remember Leonard Forster many years ago summarising a conversation he'd heard in Germany about a colleague's worthiness for a chair. Doubts were apparently raised on two grounds. One was that the colleague in question ja gar keine Schule gegründet hat. He hasn't founded a school. Um, and the second uh, reservation, as it were, was that the literary analysis, <coughs> analyses this colleague had produced were journalism rather than scholarship. Nicht als Literaturwissenschaft zu bezeichnen wären, sondern vielmehr als journalistische Literaturkritik, unquote. Well, Jim might be found wanting, wanting under both headings. He's not founded a school of Germanistik, if by that one means that his pupils are recognizably chips off the pro proverbial professorial block. He would not have wanted any such cloning. He believed in teaching, and there's a difference. But his influence in UK German studies has been, quite simply, second to none. Not least in producing scholars who think and write with real analytical drive in both English and German. And as far as the issue of literary criticism versus literary scholarship is concerned, well, Jim would not recognize that baleful distinction. His literary work is informed by profound scholarship, but he also has a strenuous sense of value. I do not think he has ever written at length on literary texts simply because they are there like mountains. On the contrary, they have to matter, and they have to matter as enriching reflections of and on human being in the world. What emerges in his literary work is not then, um, is not simply the value judgments as such, but the reasons given for these judgments. And to quote an example, and I've used it before in paying tribute to uh, Jim, when he dismisses Adelbert Stifter because the unruffled reputation, uh, re repetitions, I'm sorry, and we were talking about repetitions this afternoon, because the unruffled repetitions of his prose sound uncomfortably like slow motion hysteria, Jim may not, may not have had the last word on what Stifter has to offer us. But one has to meet Jim's criticism head on because he's rightly identified the key provocation of Stifter's prose. Or to take another example, in Life in Germany, he writes the following of Goethe's Faust, and I quote him, Faust is an extreme case of the potential cross-purposes of secularization. It is a bizarre mixture, deprived of its old theological moral point, yet retaining and adding to the original amoral episodes and still contriving to avoid the protagonist's final damnation. The treatment is so much at odds with the material that it can be seen as the most grandiose mistake in literary history." Unquote. Well, this is pretty forthright stuff. And in this lecture, I shall want, among other things, to challenge the negative verdict which it contains but to repeat a point I made earlier, I do so because Jim highlights the central issue of Goethe's Faust, its intertextual relationship to an older text, to an earlier pre-secular world. The work, work we know as Faust at Goethe as the time has three framing statements which form a sort of a set of meta-texts to the action proper of the drama, which begins, as it always did in the earlier versions of the Orfaust and Faustan fragment, with Faust's great soliloquy of discontent. Hab oder habe nun ach. All three framing, framing statements have centrally to do with human self-consciousness. The poem Zu Eignung explores the ways in which and the extent to which memory, mental, indeed fictive images, can come to replace physically immediate experience, can become a known and inhabit, inhabited reality. The second, Vorspiel auf dem Theater, thematizes an institution, the theater which is grounded in the human capacity for self-reflectivity. And the third frame, the Prolog im Himmel, recalls the Book of Job and in invoking theology, 
also brings to mind the original Faust story, the 1587 Volksbuch. At the end of Faust, we will return to theology, although the metaphysical entities here are different from those appearing in the Prolog im Himmel. The central issue in the Prolog is Faust's paradigmatic status as representative of the human species. What is highlighted is Faust's unquiet being, the discontent that derives from his acute self-consciousness. Mephisto refers to the human creature as the kleine Gott der Welt, the little god on earth, and his troubled condition derives from his being endowed with the shine des Himmelslicht, a glimpse of heaven's light. It seems that the Lord, and if I may just add a slight footnote here, this is a part in the play that has been performed by both Jim and myself in student productions at our respective universities. In other words, as Richie said, we have much in common, but we both played God, so that <laughs> must come from. <clears throat> and I think if I may be naughty, I think I did it first, but that's because my chair is a, bit, is a bit older than yours, Jim. The UCL chair is a bit older than the table. Uh, I, I, doubt <laughs> I doubt it very much. Anyway, sorry, I digress. It seems that the Lord, played by Jim and myself, uh, <coughs> the Lord, um, uh, the, the Lord um, uh, accepts, as it were, Mephisto's uh, analysis of the disquiet of the human creature. The disturbing, disturbing energies of human self-consciousness are service to the Lord. In other words, the shine des Himmelslicht that energizes, in Mephisto's view, deforms the little god of the world, is a metaphor. The metaphysics of the older intertexts have now become metaphorics. The world of Goethe's Faust drama is a secular door. To quote from a recent study by Ritchie, the current splendid holder of the Taylor chair, and I quote Ritchie, Goethe seems to restore the cosmic background in Faust, which begins with a prologue in heaven, which shows Faust in the company of the devil Mephistopheles, and ends with his ascent into heaven. But these cosmic elements are a deliberate fiction, at times ironic, at other times symbolic." Unquote. Now I very much agree with Ritchie's argument here. Goethe does indeed put before us an emerging secular world in which the central issue is not salvation or damnation but rather the justification of our being in the world, justification in our eyes and in the eyes of others. <coughs> but if this is the case, why, to return to Jim's point, does Goethe bother with the opening and closing glimpses of theology why does he bother with the old tale of a man who makes a bargain with the devil in order to transcend the limitations of his experience? And what on earth, rather than in heaven or hell, can he make of the devil figure in a secular world? Well, the answer to these questions, I venture to suggest, is that Goethe wants us to hear his drama of secular modernity in constant intertextual debate with an older narrative. And I think he is masterly at updating without thereby rubbishing so many features of the old tale. And in the process, he comes disturbingly close to suggesting that our world may have its forms of damnation and salvation. Let me begin by returning to Jim's point that Goethe even adds to the amoral episodes of the original Faust story. The central issue of this is the so-called Gretchen Tragödie, the Gretchen tragedy. Goethe seems to have sensed the limitations of the intensely episodic structure of the earlier tale. And he creates a searing love tragedy which was always present in his imagination in the early versions of his treatment of the false material. And thereby what he does is to intensify the moral argument of the drama. The destruction of Gretchen and her family is har harrowing, not least because of the haunting realism with which he brings Gretchen alive. She's a young woman who leads a humble and modest life, and when she tries to make sense of the experience of falling in love, when she tries, as it were, to soliloquize, she does so when her hands are busy at familiar tasks, undressing, getting ready for bed, working at the spinning wheel, putting flowers in the vase in the church. And she articulates her inwardness by borrowing the form of words, a folk song, a work song, a prayer. <coughs> Moreover, Goethe makes Gretchen's being expressive a historical issue. Her world is a pre-modern world, bounded by church, family, by a small-town mentality. Hence the scene of the so-called Gretchen Frage, in which she asks Faust whether he believes in God, is particularly weighty. Goethe obliges us to count the cultural and moral cost of secular modernity, 
and the intertextual spectre of damnation is never far from our minds. It's never simply over and done with. Similarly, Goethe's updating of the Faust figure allows us to hear a profusion of intertextual echoes. In Faust, the self-consciousness that is the particular endowment of the human species expresses itself in recognizable forms of modality. Faust is a scientific spirit, spirit concerned to know what makes the world tick, was die Welt im Innocent zusammenhält. As the scene of the Gretchen Frage makes clear, he's a profoundly secular spirit, and he's an individualist. Unlike Gretchen, he is not beholden in any thoroughgoing way to any community or institution. And this is made abundantly clear in the Easter walk, the Osterspaziergang, where the words of shared humanity, here bin ich Mensch, here darf ich sein, what a joy it is to be alive. The translations are very often John Williams, uh, by the way, and I want to acknowledge his, his achievement there. Here bin ich Mensch, here darf ich sein, are quoted by Faust. They are not spoken on the authority of his own experience. They are the sentiments of the village, villagers that he quotes. The Faust remains the onlooker. In part two of the drama, we see Faust in a number of guises, all of which betoken modernity, as the inventor of paper money, scientist, as a scientist making artificial life, as a historian fascinated by the classical class, as a colonial ruler. Time and again, we have Goethe's imagination working dialectically, understanding modernity as a contestation of older forms of knowing and living. What finally of the devil figure? Well, perhaps it's the greatest challenge of all to evoke the presence of sheer evil in a secular world. As I've suggested with regard to the Paul Login Himmel, the metaphysics of the old world have become metaphorics. Mephisto may function devilishly as Teufel schaffen, but the metaphorics can create mayhem. The verb schaffen can have sinister overtones, as we shall see shortly. Rosa takes two features of the original Mephisto's negativity and inflects them into modernity as the devil becomes the hideous combination of cynic, we heard about that this afternoon, and salesman. The magic of the old figure is still in evidence, but now it expresses itself as the ethos of instant gratification, the accelerated culture of click here, which we know so well in our universe of virtual reality. With the experiential impatience generated by his fierce consciousness, Faust is vulnerable to Mephisto's wiles. And behind the latter's ability to purvey money, booze, and sex in profusion, there lurks a potentially blistering negativity. Mephisto really does believe that because of the transience of all human life and experience, none of it is worth having. <coughs> he is the great debunker of human being in the world. One could think of his savage soliloquies. He puts on Faust's academic gown in order to bamboozle the hapsius student. He says of Faust, ihm hat das Schicksal einen Geist gegeben, der unge ungebändigt immer vorwärts dringt und dessen übereilte Streben der Erde Freuden überschwingt. Den schlepp ich durch das wilde Leben, durch flache Unbedeutendheit. Er soll mir zappeln, starren, kleben. John Williams' translation of the final line is wonderful. He'll flap and flutter like a bird stuck tight. Now, the brutal negativity is heard with full force in the moment of triumph over Faust's dead, Faust's dead body near the end of the play. The onlookers say, it's all over, es ist vorbei. And Mephisto reacts in fury to that verdict because it implies that there was a something that has ceased to be. For him, everything that precedes death is null and void. Vorbei, ein dummes Wort, warum vorbei und rein ist nichts. Vollkommen ist einerlei, was soll nun denn das ewige schaffen? Geschaffenes zu nichts hinwegzuwerfen, das ist vorbei. Was ist daran zu lesen? Es ist so gut, als wäre es nicht gewesen. Und treibt sich doch im Kreis, als wenn es wäre. Ich liebte mir dafür das ewig Leere. A number of comments, just quickly on these lines, which are incidentally a gift to a great actor. One is the colloquial force of the words. The final line has that kind of mir implying, if you ask me, <coughs> and the Darfield has the bitter, compressing, summarizing force of, in place of all that junk. I shall want to return later to the language of the Faust drama, but let me simply at this juncture hold fast to Mephisto's Mephist uh, mastery of the colloquial in its debunking potential. 
three illustrations must, must suffice. Think of his exaltation of the destruction of Gretchen. Habe ich doch meine Freude dran. Um, or in the Trubertag scene, sie ist die erste nicht, quoted by Kevin this afternoon. Or of his slicing reply to Gretchen's assertion that it's not the custom for young girls like her to look for love. Brauch oder nicht, das gibt sich auch. The slicing internal rhyme is masterly. <coughs> Mephisto's debunking fervor is deployed with particular virulence to human ideas, as I beg upon, to human desire which tends to bring metaphysics turn metaphorics into play as sex becomes göttlich, himmlisch. The locus classicus here is the moment in the Hexenküche when Faust sees a woman body in the magic mirror, you know, page three, as it were. I quote in extracts, Faust, welch ein himmlisch Bild zeigt sich in diesem Zauberspiegel, muss er in diesem hingesteckten Leibe den Inbegriff von allen Himmeln sehen, Mephisto. Ja, natürlich, wenn ein Gott sich erst sechs Tage plagt und am Ende selbst Bravo sagt, dann muss es was Gescheites werden. <lacht> wonderful, wonderful. <lacht> Faust lusts after Gretchen at their very first meeting. His command to Mephisto <coughs> is as primitive as it gets heard, du musst mir die Dirne schaffen. That verb, so much part of German speech even nowadays, <coughs> is the target of Mephisto's negativity in the lines I quoted earlier. He asks, what is the point of das ewige Geschaffen? Because Geschaffen as always comes to nothing. He knows whereof he speaks, because it is his role to als Teufel schaffen. Yet in the closing cadence of his drama, Goethe suggests that even the thoroughgoing nihilist will find it difficult to maintain total negativity. This happens to Mephisto, who is, to put it vulgarly, turned on by the beauty of the angels' bodies and distracted from his aim to take possession of false mortal remains. Here, Goethe invokes into text your earlier conceptions of the devil as a comic figure. Now, lust may not be the profoundest tribute of the value of the created world, discussed, but it is one all the same. Das ewig Lehrer is then answered by das ewig Weibliche of the play's final two lines. The heavenly metaphysics of the play's ending become metaphors for Goethe's tribute to the sheer erotic charge that indwells in secular worldliness. Geschaffenness has <coughs> the last word. And we hear that affirmation in intertextual debate with the 1587 Volksbuch, which ends with damnation and destruction. <coughs> I want now to leave Faust and suggest that the play and Jim's response to it and my response to it may have something important to tell us about the value and values of literary study. Faust is a work that asks us constantly to respond intertextually. In this sense, it never fails to speak to us in different ways and at different times. Like all great literature, Faust is never over and done with. It is grounded in the ongoing drama of human self-consciousness. That is both its theme and its mode. Perhaps because literary study is under attack at present, I may be allowed to offer a few comments in its defense before returning briefly to Faust, to things German, and then finally to Jim's crucial role in mediating those things German to an English public. Now, of course, I'm aware that I'm by no means the only voice defending literary study at the present time. Mary Beard, Jonathan Bate have insisted that great literature confronts us with felt human experience of love, hate, sex, war, individual national identity, and so on. And I've no wish to dissent from that argument, although such concerns could be studied as well, perhaps even better, through other disciplines, psychology, history, anthropology, sociology, and so on. A number of advocates <coughs> of literary study <coughs> have invoked what one might call the ineffability of reading literature. Matthew Arnold had recourse to the terms sweetness and light in defending the humanities in general, and especially literature against narrow instrumentalization. F. R. Leavis steadfastly refused, perhaps quixotically, to theorize and taxonomize the living principle involved in literary study as he understood it. Similar strategies can be heard from Martha Nussbaum and from Terry Eagleton in his recent writings. And I agree with them, but I want to suggest that the cardinal experience of reading literature has to do with the particular process of understanding which it demands of us. I have in mind the unfortunately named hermeneutic circle, which is anything but a vicious circle, 
Um, brother, it explicates the constant back and forth we enact as we relate, for example, individual lines of a poem we've never read before to its gradually emerging totality of signification, and as we relate that evolving totality to the individual lines which read differently and then remodify the totality. Now, this process of understanding is one of known and reflected gradualness. It is poles apart from cyber mouse clickery from rapid and instrumentalizing access to information, which we are all enjoy, enjoined to engage in daily. The meaning of the literary text, its aboutness, is not a given, it is made, and we need to respect and cherish and explicate that meaning. Literary study is dialogic, and that dialogic dimension creates an ethical space, a space for debate and discussion, a space that, space that for Martha Nussbaum is inherently democratic. Literary study deals not in truth with a capital T, that is the province of theology, perhaps also of philosophy, depending on your view of philosophy. Literary study de deals in truthfulness, which is generated by the interplay of recognizably human voices, the voice of the text, the voice of the reader of the text in debate. It issues into F.R. Leavis's, it is so, isn't it? This is, this is how it works, this poem, isn't it? This is how it works. And in this sense, it offers a challenge, literary study, to religious and scientific fundamentalisms, both of which assert themselves stri stridently in our culture nowadays. Frequently, the literary work can embody the process of genesis within it, even if it's final form, and in a lecture, delivered recently, the University of Sheffield, Jim spoke about his current research project, which concerns the genesis of literary works. Because literary creation is a process, our engagement with literary text is processual in that we are aware of reading within multiple contexts. <coughs> we read for the thenness and the nowness of the text, for its lo localizable thereness and its mediated, translated everywhereness. What, it in, what is involved in all literary study is a process of enlightenment, spelt with a small e, although the capitalised form of the noun will have claims to make on us as readers, and I'll return to that spelling in a moment. It's like all great literature travels well. Indeed, this is one of the cardinal indicators of its greatness. Nowadays, in modern language departments, there is much discussion about translational and transnational texts. Well, the change of only one consonant differentiates the two words and their meanings overlap. But I think it's important to stress that the key texts, however transferable they are, start somewhere. Start in a particular linguistic and cultural locality. Faust is a profoundly German work and has frequently been taken to be emblematic of Germany. Not always, it has to be said, with the most noble of intentions and with the most uplifting of consequences. But German it is. And its language exploits the full resources of German. <coughs> so many quotations from Faust have become part of the standard repertoire of the German language. Just Pudel's Kern, zwei Seelen wohnen auch in meine Wurst, sie ist die erste nicht, and so on. Much the same is true of Hamlet and its omnipresence in the English language. Moreover, Goethe's Faust, Goethe's Faust drama ranges with extraordinary authority across registers which take us from the philosophical and sublime to the colloquial. I've already drawn attention to Mephisto's for fondness, fondness for the reductive force of the everyday vernacular. But those registers are also present in Gretchen's speech, where frequently one can hear the presence of dialect. One thinks of the rhyme, which works within Frankfurt German. And a recent in a recent exchange in the German Studies Network, Dan Wilson reminded us of an instant, a very early version, subsequently edited out of Der König in Thule, of a double negative, trank nie keinen Tropfen mehr. Dialect, <coughs> humble speech then, is part of the location, localization of Gretchen's being. But the colloquial can be heard also in false language, most particularly in the great opening soliloquy, which rubbishes all forms of academic study, and I always found was particularly attractive to my students at UCL. <laughs> Think of bin so klug as wie so vor, and of, and this is a particular favourite of German minds, on tu nicht mehr in Worten kramen and not mess about with words anymore. 
I said to students, if you don't know what that means, what are you doing here? If you want to, why don't you reflect on what has happened here? Faust's desire for Gretchen comes out, as we've already noted, in unadorned laddishness. Heard in was mit die schaffen. Indeed, that verb schaffen, <coughs> on which we have seen Mephisto pour scorn in his speech of triumph over the dead Faust, occurs again in ugly form when Faust ranges at the little bell of Philemon and Baltus's dwelling, which signals that the land he desires, it's not all his. Wie schaff ich mir es vom Gemüte, das Glöcklein läutet und ich wüte. The linguistic range of Goethe's Faust text is stunning. In large measure, <coughs> due to the legacy of the Luther Bible. Goethe helps us to hear and reflect on the German language at every turn. I want to suggest he does what every major writer does to his own language. He, to borrow a phrase from T.S. Eliot's Little Gidding, purifies the dialect of the tribe. But purification is not so much an act of fastidious cleansing. Rather, it embodies the need and the ability to extend that dialect to its full expressivity. As a result, the dialect becomes the dialectic, the dialectic of the tribe's lingo. It remains on the one hand local specific, but on the other it becomes translational and transnational. Jim's command of and feel for the German language is, I think, incomparable. He is a superb translator of Goethe, also particularly memorably of Heine. In all his writings, whether on Kant or Goethe or Schiller or Thomas Mann, one senses his ability to cherish the German language, working at full pressure. And he writes German with extraordinary ease and authority. He is superbly at home in the language, and the voice we hear is recognizably his, and not just all-purpose academic German prose. Here he is writing in the Goethe Handbuch on Goethe's poetry, and when one thinks about it, it was quite some honor for an English Germanist to be entrusted with the task of providing the lead article which introduces Goethe's poetry to a modern audience, a modern German audience. Jim highlights the key concepts, the, and I quote him, Begriffe, die seit jeher zur Charakterisierung von Goethe's Lyrik gedient haben, Erlebnis, Gelegenheit, Spontaneität, Unmittelbarkeit. So alt vertraut sie klingen, mögen sie bleiben, gleichwohl unentbehrlich, weil sie Tatsachen bezeichnen, die für Goethe's Lyrik konstitutiv sind und in der Lyrikdiskussion generell nicht fehlen dürfen. Erst recht nicht aufgrund modernen skeptischen Vorurteils. Now that closing phrase allows us to hear Jim's dislike of theory, which in his view desubstantializes and dehumanizes the study of the literature. And the rhythm of his argument is superbly expressed in the German, in the Gleichwohl of Sie bleiben Gleichwohl und Entbehrlich, and the Erst recht nicht of the final clause. Jim's most recent book is called Light in Germany. <coughs> it summarizes a lifetime work and it is concerned with enlightenment with a capital E, <coughs> with a particular grouping or concentration of ideas which seek to challenge dogma in the surface, service of human autonomy, creativity and critical thought. And the defense of those values at the present time is the central trajectory of this deeply felt book. But Jim also acknowledges enlightenment with a small e, meaning any set of thought processes that enable human beings to know and to reflect critically on what it is to be alive. His work on imaginative literature has everything to do with those enlightening, with a small e, processes, but also with a big e, processes of gradual dialogic understanding, which unfold as we interact with the literary work. For Jim, the all-important texts have been written in German, although he's no narrow Germanist, and his current project, I can only go on the lecture he gave um, in, in, uh, in Sheffield, takes him to Montaigne and Shakespeare. So he's no narrow Germanist, but German texts have had a priority for him, and he's brought them close to English readers, but also to German readers, and has made them part of Weltliteratur, understood not as rows of books groaning on shelves, but as processes of mediated understanding, whereby the local becomes, if you like, the translational and the transnational. 
He, as Taylor Professor here in Oxford, has been a stupendous mediator, enabling English and German culture to listen to one another, to reflect on each other. He's been totally at home in the English Goethe Society, in the Weimar Goethe Society, in the Weimar Goethe Gesellschaft. And all of us fervently look to that chair, that Taylor chair, to continue in the task, even after the retirement of its present incumbent, Richie Robertson, who is the entirely worthy successor to Jim. Now, more than ever in Brexit times, we need that voice that brings Germany and things German to light that spreads that light abroad. That light is, amongst other things, the intellectual ferment um, that serves to define European modernity. And that is why the chair of German, particularly the chair of German, I think, is so important. One could argue that in the late 18th century, France defines political modernity, England defines economic and industrial modernity, and Germany defines conceptual and philosophical modernity. Central to that project is the Enlightenment written with a capital E. In light in Germany, we are privileged to hear German's voice advocating that Enlightenment in every paragraph. And we also hear on every page the English critic's delight in things German. And that delight has truly given the Taylor chair its mediating role. And in a beautifully understated form, the very opening page of this book is an instance of such mediation. Because what it does is to dedicate the book to Anne, Jim's wife. And the dedication is simple, and somehow it seems particularly wonderful because it's in German. It reads not for Anne, but für Anne. Thank you, Jim, for having founded as Taylor Professor, the only kind of school that is worth funding, founding, which is one that upholds and spells out and spreads aboard the value of critical human reflectivity. And to end on a less exalted note, congratulations on your birthday. And to use a phrase that doesn't easily translate into German, many, many happy returns, Jim. <laughs> Thank you.